What I'm going to talk about are traffic rules in the brain. I think all of us have seen pictures of the human brain. And this is a little drawing of what is present inside the brain, which is all these cells called neurons. And immediately when you see these kinds of drawings, which are made by Santiago Ramoni Cajal, who's often called the father of neuroscience, because he was one of the first people who started using a very special kind of stain. So he could look at individual neurons and not just look at that lump of drawing that you often see, which is the brain. Actually, if you touch, it's kind of squishy. Uh, if you get ever get hold of a brain. And you can see that these are like these long projections that come out of one little object, which is often called a cell body. And it's, Looks, if you look from above, and let's say you are looking above a great city, it looks like roads which are going from places to others. This little, each individual cell is called a neuron. And one neuron will connect up with many other neurons, as well as it can connect up with your muscle. So I just wanted to take a step back. You've, several of you may have come to many of the TTAS sessions. But I thought I would take a step back and talk about how do scientists approach questions, okay? And this is important because if one day you want to quiz a scientist or become one yourself, these are good questions to ask. Why are you working on what you're working on? How are you working on it? And what have you found? Very, very simple questions but they lie at the heart of every scientific problem. It doesn't matter if it is biology or physics or anything else. In fact, even, even if you use engineering problems, these questions remain. So we are going to take this thread of why, how, and what, and sort of carry it through this little talk. Okay, so if it was an oral audience, uh, which is, I know, a little difficult. The question I would ask is, why should we bother studying the brain? And I guess you're not going to be allowed to be unmuted. But so I give an answer myself. And here's a little fanciful drawing by a former student of mine who now works in Science Gallery, Bangalore, by the way. Uh, and if you ever get a chance, go and look at their online exhibits. And why should we bother studying the brain. You know, what's so special about it? Maybe everybody should be studying COVID and microbes. After all, everybody's life has been upended by one tiny little thing which we can't even see with our own eyes. But I would make the case that there is nothing more fascinating than looking at the brain. And the reason is it controls three big things which are central to all animal life perception, thought, and action. So the nervous system allows you to perceive the world around you. So you know this is a beautiful picture, potentially sunrise or sunset. So you're seeing both perception and thought. When someone is drinking orange juice in the morning, perhaps you feel like some of us do, that a Coke might be better. For me, my poison of choice would be coffee and not Coke. But that's perception, recognizing that this is orange juice. But boy, that's too healthy for me. And that's not what I want. To melted ice cream might be even better. Who knows? Pain is something very often all of us feel it, where we have bumped ourselves somewhere or injured ourselves. Or a favorite cricketer has, you know, has done something to themselves and they can't play the next match and they are in pain. So pain is another function that we are able to tell that something has happened to our body depends on the nervous system, depends on those little cells that I showed you in the, in the beginning, which were Ramoni Kahal's drawings, which then collect and send information, which allow you to then take an action. You can decide, oh, you know, what I really should be doing today is going out and playing with my friends, uh, and play cricket or play basketball or whatever it is. 
And that is action. So you take a thought and you have an action from it. Or you can say, ah, if I bend my body in this way, if you have a grandpa and say, it hurts, and I should actually not bend my body this way. And that is an action as well. So the nervous system as a whole, in pretty much every organism in which it's present, is the substrate or is the means through which this organism perceives the world, analyzes information, synthesizes it, has thoughts, and takes action. What else is very important is studying the nervous system is for things like injuries. So here is a picture of someone you will not recognize, but the costume you make. This is a Superman costume. And he was one of the early actors who played Superman. He was, his name is Christopher Reeves, and there is still a foundation today, the Christopher Reeves Foundation, which gives out grants for doing spinal cord research. What ended up happening with him is he rode a horse, he fell on his neck, he injured it, and his neck nerves got damaged severely, such that after that, he was just stuck on a wheelchair and couldn't move around. You may have also heard with India's aging population, which exists, there are many old people and many of us have uh, you know, older members in our family. They can have diseases such as Parkinson's disease where you have tremors or Alzheimer's disease or dementia where you don't remember things. These are all major diseases and injury situations which hit the nervous system which make it very, very difficult for the individual to have good quality of life. And I'll tell you one other thing why you should study the brain is that look at COVID. Within less than a year, we had vaccines, we have drugs, and we have means to deal with this, even though it's such has upended our life and really changed it. Even after decades of research, it has been very difficult to address issues or diseases associated with the nervous system. So a lot more investigation is needed. Things are very, very complex. I will stop here and take questions. Certainly, certainly, Sandhya. Snail, we have a couple of really good questions. We can... Uh, so I think Uttara, Uttara had a question in the beginning, right, Snail? Um, yes. I'm just going to scroll back. Uh, yeah, I think there is, there, uh, Sandhya, her question is, are, th are there memory cells running through neurons? Ah, so when you say memory cells, there is just a certain region of the brain which has neurons over there. And those neurons seem to be very important for holding memories. Okay, so in the human brain or the vertebrate brain, uh, that region is called the hippocampus. If you look at little fruit fly, which will come when you are, you know, when you have rotting bananas on your table, which you have not eaten, yeah. that region is called the central complex. But each of those, the underlying cells, which are important for holding memory, are neurons. I see. Okay. 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 Uh, Anushka has a very interesting question. So in the slide where you talked about pain, we talked about all kinds of physical pain, but she asks, what about emotional pain? Is that also because of neurons yes. in the brain? Yes, absolutely. So when you, when you hear about people having depression, schizophrenia, um, you know, manic disorder, and, you know, affective disorders of any sort, the reason is that the network properties of neurons are affected. And there are issues associated with that. So for instance, for depression, there are ways in which one neuron talks to another neuron. And one of the treatments allows the talking to improve. And that can have slightly better outcomes if you have depression. There are these drugs, you might have heard of them or talked about called SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And serotonin is one molecule which allows one neuron to talk to another. And having that drug, which is an SSRI, allows that talking to happen slightly better. So yes, those kinds of mental health diseases are also comes from problems in neuronal circuits. Okay, moving on to a really fun question. What happens to your brain when you get brain freeze? 
brain freeze i wish i could answer that question because i also <laughs> have brain freeze frequently you know if i haven't thought about every single part of something and if someone ask me a question I, most often is a brain freeze i have to admit Absolutely i don't correct. know the answer to that question that. but i yes. am convinced that neurons are involved because if i <laughs> open my mouth to talk neurons are involved thinking neurons are involved so brain freeze neurons must be involved yes definitely okay uh, i think the next question is are there different types of neurons or specific neurons in specific regions of the brain absolutely there are neurons of many different kinds there are neurons which allow me to sense touch i know i'm wearing a kurta but i also know when i put on the kurta i felt it but after some time i ignore it i don't feel it like you wear a very soft sweater only once in a while you'll be thinking oh i won a soft sweater right so you can habituate so there are the touch neurons in fact touch neurons is some of the neurons we look at in my own lab then you have photoreceptor neurons that's how you see the world or you have neurons in the ear which is how you hear then you have moving neurons right or called motor neurons how do i move my hand i can even see myself move my hand that's because they are motor neurons which allow you to move your hand so there are many kinds of neurons and then there are integrator neurons they are often called interneurons which connect between the perception arm and the action arm right and those interneurons integrate information from many neurons to tell the action arm to do whatever it does okay all right i think we can move ahead and we'll come okay fantastic so we'll go so as i said the neuro the nervous system is made of wired circuits so there are many nerves which are present here and they all in, not all of them interconnect to each other but several of them interconnect to each other and they populate the entire body and i thought i would give you a sense of how interconnected everything is using this picture which comes from both the genelia research campus and the allen institute where you see these neurons and how interwoven they are with each other which allows one neuron to talk to another neuron for instance with this chemical called serotonin which i talked about okay so the brain is made of wired circuits and to summarize what does it do sit sense integrate transmit and that's what it does so if anybody tells you what does a brain do you can say sense integrate transmit sit so that could be one simple take away that you have from the talk since i had told you that these neurons are so important and individual neurons are important so what does one neuron do what happens in those long thin processes that i just showed you right so there was this um scientist called paul weiss who did this very beautiful experiment and this is a picture from his paper that he published from that time and he was interested in neurons so we, remember i told you about injury and the sup, uh, the superman guy who was very fit but fell from a horse this is around the time of when world war 2 had ended and what happened in world war 2 is ever this was when air firing was like really took on a major role in uh, in uh, you know in in warfare sad to say and but you also then had anti aircraft fire and the planes were not as reliable as they are today so many young men would just the planes would get holes in it they would crash and they would have serious injuries and like that superman picture were unable to walk now if you scratch yourself on your skin your skin heals right so people figured out that one of the reason these people were not getting better was that their neurons were not getting better and so people got very interested in this, what is happening in those long cables which are connecting different parts of the body so paul weiss did this very clever experiment and it's an experiment that you can do in your own home not with neurons but with a little pipe in one side you connect it to a tap open the tap slowly the pipe will have water flowing through it now just squish it this is what he did he tried a little knot around the neuron he now waited several weeks when you do it in your home you will probably see it in a minute or two 
and what he saw was here is flu and here was a bulge because now you didn't have place to move so you knew that from the cell body material was moving material was moving from that little cell body material was coming back to the cell body so movement was occurring in both direction there was flow of material so it was not a wire which was just sitting like a copper wire of an electrical circuit but this was a wire in which things were happening inside so now you can go two directions right you can say oh we know something is moving we need to look inside the neuron so how can you look inside the neuron you peel off the skin of the neuron and just peer inside that's what some people did so hirokawa these are nobutaka hirokawa he works in my area of research and he's a very senior scientist he took these wonderful electron micrographs so one of the things which people who work on neurons have always used is complicated microscopes so this is a microscope with which you can look at great detail and what you saw when you peeled off the skin of the neuron and peered inside you see a lot of little different kinds of balls and attached to this kind of string like structures right so we can so if you want the technical language this is a mitochondria which is a power of the cell these are different vesicles or you can use a more general term they are cargo they are things which are possibly contributing to the flow that we saw but then ron wail uh, with some help from um uh who's uh, some a couple of other people were involved in woods hole did this prep other people also have done this prep but these movies come from ron wail where you now you open the skin but instead of killing the cell and looking in looking at it in the microscope you don't kill it you just peel off the skin or peel off the top of the cell and then just peer to see what is happening so remember all those little organelles those circles and elongated structures we saw here is what we see them moving these are in fact actually mitochondria some of them wiggle but they move here one moved there's another small circle moving here's another small circle moving and then you can spread them out a little bit more and look at it and here's what is an amazing movie which i like i want you to pay attention and i hope you can see my uh, see the uh, hand i want you to pay attention to these little lines and use a little bit of imagination which all of you have much more than me okay and i'm just going to play this video do you see these things walking along these lines they're not walking anywhere else if these lines are not present they're not walking on them these are called microtubules and are cellular roads in fact if you stand above pune or bombay or whatever new york or shanghai and attach a camera or you look from a flight or even you look from a very tall building you will see all these it's very akin to what you would see about moving vehicles on roads so inside neurons things are happening exactly what human beings are doing driving on roads hang on to that thought how do you actually move this and this is a small little so i think these slides will be available afterwards so you can certainly go and watch the youtube videos for the longer one is very pretty with some very interesting music but people now know how they move and there are specific kind of motor proteins that do the movement so i'll just show you this is one big cargo one big circle or oval that you show on the first picture on the second picture where it was wiggling around perhaps this is not a mitochondria here but some organelle some little cargo and what you see is this protein is walking hand over hand and carrying cargo see that so that's an animation of a protein which is walking hand over hand and carrying cargo and it's a very beautiful movie which tells you how along this 
cellular road, this little vesicle and this protein is being moved. Okay, we will stop here and take questions. Yes, definitely. Uh, I think Advita had a question about the previous video itself. She was just asking if you could repeat what is happening in the video. Oh, in this video? Yes. Okay. So in this video, you are looking at objects like this, which we got by feeling of. And we are looking at them not in when they are killed and you're just looking at it. It's, you know, if you have a little bug and you kill it, you're not going to learn as much about it necessarily in, or at least the same way as if you let it do what it does and observe it. So you can do those kinds of experiments. And after doing those kinds of experiments, the understanding is animated here where you see that little oval here, it's called a vesicle, is attached to a protein which walks along those thin roads, which I showed you in the previous video. So this motor protein is what drags that vesicle along these roads. Okay, Kavish has a very nice question as a follow-up to this video itself. Yes, his question is, when they're walking along this road, is it possible that two of them bump into each other? Absolutely, and that's what we're coming to. Next part of the talk. So okay. the, the questions that come up are like open research questions in the field from our young minds. They inspire us to go back and ask better questions in the lab. Yes, so, yes. I, I'm sorry. Did I mute myself by mistake? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. So I just said that, yes, the next question which I'm going to ask, uh, I'll try to answer is actually, we are now going to move to work that has we have done in my lab. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Okay. Okay. Uh, another question is, what do these vesicles actually do? Ah, you remember we told, somebody asked a question about what happens in, um, you know, when you have emotional issues or mental health issues, a uh, mental health uh, um, needs, for instance, with depression, and I talked about serotonin, this little vesicle could well be filled with serotonin and allow for you know, so this little vesicle will walk towards the particular place in the neuron and then attach with it and dump all the serotonin inside it. So this is a bag of cargo. Think of it like trucks which are carrying tomatoes in it or an Amazon truck is one and a flip cart is another with material inside it, right? So this is exactly like that. It's a carrier and this motor is the engine. Okay, we've had lots of questions in the chat window, which I'm going to now all club together about dreams, nightmares, sleeping, and what is the role of neurons and our brain in this? Okay, lots is known, but I will address one amongst all of these. Dream, uh, sleep is controlled by the nervous system. It is sensitive to hunger state. It is sensitive to how much exercise you get, but it is definitely all of these things are controlled by the nervous system, okay? As are presumably dreams, right? Because that is related to a kind of sleep in which, in fact, those kinds of phases in vertebrate sleep are supposed to be very, very important for memory formation. And you might, if not now, I am certain when you are in college or in 12th standard will have the experience of simply doing what I have heard night out in the expectation <laughs> that whatever you cram into your head, you will remember. But you will actually find that sleep is very important for things like memory consolidation, that is remembering better and for longer periods of time. So, you know, if you can do yourself a few favors and tell yourself the truth that night outs are actually for hanging out with your friends. <laughs> we agree. We <laughs> agree. And right now there's no energy for night out. So we are on the <laughs> other side of the hill. Which is but, very but, sad. Yeah. We have a very but, nice uh, question from Nirali. Her question yes. is, um, in all of these traffic and traffic jams, who are the traffic police? Are there any traffic police? Are there? Hmm, that's an interesting question. There are certainly molecules which allow traffic to take place, but we don't know if there are global police. 
what we do know, remember I talked about people who have Alzheimer's disease. There's another uh, disease called ALS, or, uh, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a motor neuron disease where people often cannot move. And their motor neurons, things that control the motor uh, movement, um, you know, sort of degenerate or have issues with them. In many of these diseases, when you make models of them in other systems and you look at the neurons, you find that there is much less traffic taking place. So clearly traffic is controlled differently or is affected in diseased neuron versus healthy neurons. But they don't, they don't appear to be global signals to say whether you should move or not with a few small exceptions. Essentially, because you need to have things moving, no? If you don't have things moving, you will not have turning taking place. Today, you had tomatoes, and if you have tomatoes one month later coming into your house, it's not going to work, no? We use things like tomatoes and potatoes and onions on a very regular basis. So things have to keep coming. And Absolutely. that's how you should think about transport inside a neuron. Yeah. It's a constant so delivery note. situation. Constant delivery, right? Pretty much like what Amazon is trying to deliver now. So, uh, Sandhya, Allah had just to clarify, she says, so it's the cell organelles inside the neurons that are moving. Yes, inside the neuron. That's why I said that what you do in those neurons is you remove its cell membrane. That is, you peel it off and then you can see what's inside it, either in fixed preparation with a microscopy or in non-fixed preparation with microscopy where you can see things moving. It's organelles inside the neuron. Perfectly correct. Okay, all right. I think we'll have one more question before we move on. And the question is, does electricity run through neurons? Absolutely does. I have just barely one last class left when I'm teaching basic neuroscience. And the way one neuron talks to an another is, uh, is through using electrical signaling, which is all and which then connects up with chemical signaling where neurotransmitters like serotonin are released after they are carried in bags like this. Yes, electricity. That's a very useful way and a very honored way of studying the nervous system using electrophysiological techniques. Okay, all right. I think we can move ahead and we'll come back to some more questions later. Okay, so let's hope. I, so the same question. Are there traffic rules in the brain? So I made that analogy to what you see on roads. Are there traffic rules in India? Or are we just imagining them? Uh, and I would roads, go with the latter. <laughs> actually, no. Actually, no. I don't think so. Neurons are like Indian roads. That's my favorite end thing, which I like to say. Neurons are like Indian roads. They have rules over there. What are the rules? Let's look at them. But the first question to ask if you're a scientist, we've established why these questions are interesting to look at. How do you study these questions? Right? So I'll come to something which is actually a movie from my lab. You can think of many ways to study this question. Supposing you wanted to study traffic on roads, you can see I'm going to paint the Amazon trucks green and I'm going to paint the flip truck trucks blue. Or you can say all the black and yellow taxis are anyway have black and yellow. So I'll be track all the black and yellow taxis. They go everywhere. I'll figure out if there are any rules. Let us say all of this, you have come from Mars and you're looking, that's what you'll do. We are the people who are coming from Mars for the little critter that I look at, which is called C. elegans and its neurons. So let's look at how when you paint a cargo a certain, in this case, it looks black, but it's actually using a protein called GFP, which is fluorescent and which under a microscope, in the way we look at it, it looks green. But here is a black and white movie. And this reminds me, I should make it a green movie. Okay, here's a little critter, which we look at, C. elegans. We trap it. We turn on fluorescent light. And now you can see these vesicles, which contain things like serotonin moving around, going in both directions, like what Paul Weiss showed was the flow. Let's look at it once more. Things are moving in both directions happily. But some areas, things are not moving at all. 
So here, yeah, things are not moving at all. Let me tell you a tiny story here about how scientists not only do science, but are inspired by the people that they talk to. So I showed such a movie to my collaborator, Gautam Menon, who is a physicist and a theoretical biologist. And he kept asking me, oh, I can understand things are moving around. After all, you know, people like Ron Vale and others have seen things moving around. But why are they not moving at all? Why do you have some things that don't move? And now let's think about it. If you were coming from Mars and looking at our Indian market area, you will see some things are moving and other things are just stuck. And you might say, are they parked? Are they parked for a reason? Is it that they cannot move ahead because of something else? Is it that if there is a motor, that motor has stopped working? Or is that engine has stopped working? So it's broken down. Can you distinguish between all of these things? So is it something that's, you know, if you're broken down, maybe that's like a sick neuron, something like that, right? So we started looking, inspired by this conversation with Gautam, at what causes cargo to stop. And again, it's a pity this is not live in some ways, you know, in a room. Otherwise, I'll ask, as a driver, and I am one, as anybody else's driver, the most frustrating thing for you is when you travel in a crowded road. And what stops you from going here and there? It's all those people who occupy the road, not necessarily other cars which are driving, but all those people who will park their cycles, their motorcycles, their cars in any which way. Or if you go to a slightly more crowded market, I always like to give the uh, example, of course, I don't know the equivalent in Pune, 8th Cross Malleshwaram. Lovely, beautiful road in Bangalore, in 8th Cross Malleshwaram. Both sides in the evening, there's flower seller, uh, vada seller, uh, lock seller, earring seller. And the road, which is for quite broad, has become half in, half, half of it is occupied, right? So what we can do is color. And I think that's what my next slide is. And so we're now going to discuss what we found out, okay? So we can color all these people who are on the side and blocking, we think might be blocking it, right? So in cells, we can color those things. They're called actin-rich regions or actin filaments. And we can also color other cargo. So here what we see is one cargo, which actually holds neurotransmitter or can hold neurotransmitter is in red. And here is a person who's occupying the road on the side. Okay, in neurons, they do useful things. And buying earrings and flowers on the side of the road or some kind of, you know, chatpata snack on the side of the road is very nice. They are also doing something useful, but they also have an impact on transport. And let's watch what happens. Came to a stop. Just like you would if you were driving on a crowded road, which had all the side places occupied or a good part, you move from the footpath onto the road and put all these things, right? So, you know, what do you conclude from this? You conclude that traffic jams of movement of cargo, and these are healthy neurons, these are not sick neurons, these are not Parkinson neuron, can occur in regions which are crowded. And that intuitively makes sense because we have everyday experience of it when we drive, right? In crowded regions where lots of people are sitting on the side, you have blockages. What we also saw and which is not shown here is that if one cart, one cargo comes right next to another cargo which is not moving, then too it will stop. The equivalent of this is if there is a car or a truck or an auto rickshaw which is stopped in front of you, you come behind it, you will also stop because there's something stopped in front of you. So essentially, that is also crowded. It's just not crowded by someone who's selling snacks on the side of the road. It's crowded by another person like you who has stopped in front of you. And this is to be my dormant experience growing up. And it has changed slightly, but not much. In the middle of the road, you'll be driving slowly less common now in major cities, still common smaller cities and regions. 
you will see your friend you will see this with taxi drivers they will see they will slow down and chat with that other person right it might be a short conversation but what happens to all the people behind they will all have to stop so in crowded regions you have traffic jams in healthy nuances so what must you be about traffic zen that's what you need to tell every adult who is driving it's normal and you need to be zen about it okay i can stop here and go on to my next three slides yes okay we have lots of questions uh, about this slide um i think one of the questions is what why do they stop or what happens when they stop and how do they resolve this resolving is coming okay why do they stop we think they stop because there's no space for them to move the same reason why a driver on indian roads stops neurons are like indian roads if there is no space ahead of you you cannot move ahead at least that's what we conclude through this study are there going to be other chemical factors which trap it locally yes but we think that a lot of the traffic jams can be explained purely by the fact that there is no space ahead for them to move okay uh another question i think from kavish which is also very nice um is like in 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 traffic when we get stuck we try to find a smaller lane patli gali that we can take to escape so is there something equivalent like that coming coming neurons i like indian roads hang on to it this is an amazing analogy amazing and the fact that everybody is asking questions based on this exact analogy is just beautiful yeah, that's absolutely. why i chose this part of my work to talk about <laughs> great choice sanya i say yes sanya there's one question which is good what if they never stopped what would happen if this cargo never stopped that is physically not possible and i'll tell you why that's because you remember those long cellular roads that i showed you in the beginning those thread like structures on which they were walking they all end they do, they are not there is not one such a road starting from the cell body all the way to the end of the neuron they are like the staggered set of ladders it's kind of hard to see in the next movie that i'm going to show you which is a simulation which gautam has done based on some of the work that we have done together um or gautam student uh, vinod and reshma have done but this overlapping regions is why naturally the road comes to an end you know so you never going to have just that so any traffic you know this is before gautam asked me the question why do they stop and why are they stop for so long every person who has ever looked at moving cargo has seen a lot of cargo which was stopped remember that example which i first showed you from ron bales lab where you remove the skin and i showed you things which were moving around most of them were just jiggling in place they were not really moving right so people always thought there were other reasons they are not moving but now we provide a reason based on experiments that we have done that one of the reasons might be what we would call physically there is no space for them to move ahead and that physical locking in place comes from actin rich regions and also just other cars which are stopped actin rich regions the analogy that i use are the snack sellers and the lock sellers on the side of the road and other cars are exactly that you could have a truck in front of you you could have a car in front of you in both of these cases the same thing will happen okay i think another question that has been popping up quite a bit in the chat and maybe it will be easier to clarify is do neurons also move or is there only movement inside the neuron neurons can bend so supposing you have a neuron here right which runs here it runs over here so when you bend your hand that neuron has to accommodate that bend and so it will move and that's one of the reasons the roads are not continuous because then they will break instead now the roads can move around and you know adjust to this kind of bending but they are not like bacteria which you might have seen in this forum or other cells which crawl and go somewhere so sometimes immune cells things which fight off diseases will sense that there is a disease bug over there and they will crawl over there that neurons don't do once they are adults and you know functioning in a proper nervous system 
when they are growing out they will do that crawling motion but not otherwise okay i think we can go ahead and then okay. we'll come back so of course like any indian driver i'm sure like your parents or if you have a you know taxi driver that you take every day the biggest question is how do you escape traffic jams all of you are aware of google maps but i'm sure your grandparents are not aware of google maps or use them as often so neurons as far as we know don't have google maps otherwise you can just take google maps and say oh it's red oh i won't go it's yellow maybe i'll go if it is important oh it's green yeah 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 this is a great time to go but in the absence of google maps what can a neuron do or if you're already on the road and you're going somewhere and then it becomes very crowded what do you do so here is a simulation done as i said by gautam and his students based on work that we have done and it just tells you in fact the answer came through there right so you're working walking on roads and there are many such roads and you can see how things are moving i'll just pause it here what do you see here if you move in one road and there is something stuck in front of you you don't have any place to move forward no because that road is band you can't go right so here is a situation where you are not going to change your road you just stay on that road and what do you see eventually if you take that choice you will not be able to go anywhere you will be stuck here is the last vesicle coming stuck now you allow what indians do very well squeeze into small places change lanes do that and what you see and we'll go over it once more it's just a 20 second movie and you now see transport is restored or movement is restored it's just watch it it's so beautiful i love this animation and since it comes from our work it's particularly appealing going and you're going in both directions so it's a local decision exactly like the driver on indian cars it's a local decision for you to oops i'm so sorry um it's a local decision to move around and change what is called lanes so this is what you call a spatial change of or relaxation of traffic jams you relax a traffic jam or bypass it or escape it by just changing the lane that you're moving in so that's a decision based in space very common all of us have seen this happen but you can have a second type of escaping traffic jams and just spend a little time thinking about it so i'll pause this over here okay and that is using time and when i talked about google maps essentially when you take a decision whether you leave or not that is a temporal decision that's a decision based on time are you going to leave now or half an hour later when you think red will become yellow but there's another way to think about it if you're in a crowded situation and sometimes you will see two wheelers and other people do that people will sort of on their two wheeler walk backwards and then they will turn the two wheel a little bit and try to squeeze in somewhere right what are they doing they are doing a little reversal right so that little reversal is what we see and what i say is you sample the same space crowded space at a different time a two wheel a driver is maybe making two minutes apart but you could also think of other reason oh this is so much traffic jam let's just stop here drink some tea and you know or you have some ice cream or finish some other thing which we had planned in and then go ahead right so that's also one where you can go back and forth and in fact neurons do that inside neurons cargo do that so here's a two color movie in which you're looking at in green all those little actin patches or all those if you want to have this analogy people who are selling things on the side of the road and red is the little car or cargo which is filled with neuro which can be filled with neurotransmitter which is moving and it is a dense bit of crowding over here there's another dense bit of crowding on the road let's see what this vesicle does i've started from the beginning oops
i still don't have a good handle on okay here let's just watch this it goes back and forth and it keeps trying to get through right you can follow the red arrow and the red ball comes here okay made it through one patch of crowded area go back and forth back and forth back and forth and then finally it comes up here right so essentially this kind of reversing and checking out the same space over a given time it seems to be very effective that means locally some small space is opening up or being rearranged and you are able to drive yourself through that little region okay and that's very important now what that is something we as human drivers do as well maybe not as often as lane changing but we do them as well and in fact if you don't have lane changing and you are narrow single roads that's a very common behavior that human drivers do but what about other situations we only think of traffic jams inside neurons and human drivers many many organisms can have traffic jams here is an example from ants okay and ants make burrows and make nests and you might have seen ant little people you know ants moving in a line along you know when they run after sugar or they eat something or you know you can see them right so here is an example of an ant which is a very nice study it's one of my favorite studies in fact somebody in my lab actually wrote about this paper in tamil for a tamil kids newspaper all right and i'll just show you there is a traffic jam over here i'm not showing you the earlier video from the paper but you know there's no space to go ahead look at the behavior of the ants they attempt the place you know this big one came is attempting the place but eventually you know this one doesn't want to give up no but it finally begins to back up so is that a universal rule is reversing a universal rule is reversing in a strategy that you can use for you know bypassing traffic jams at least locally for a little bit of time and that's an interesting question for which we of course don't know the answer because when you say something is a universal rule you need many more examples in the one or two that i've showed you today but certainly a very intriguing idea there are other ways of escaping traffic jams and these happen inside cells as well so i showed you what happens inside neurons on those little cellular roads but if you look at dna proteins are walking on it and they also face traffic jams due to physical crowding many proteins if they are walking on it they can dash into each other and what has been shown by this particular study they, they suggest that what might be happening is when they see this kind of hurdle the protein can jump over that hurdle or hop over that hurdle okay and we can take some questions here but i can show you the next video and if you're thinking about hopping over hurdles let's look at some real hopping which might help frustrated drivers and here is a beautiful video which i would love to have a car like that okay and let's just spend uh, 20 seconds looking at it here it is crowded It, don't ask me how real it is i like to think it's real hey, it's not going the height of a helicopter or anything it's just hovering a little above the cars and getting away right so cool i thought okay so we can stop here and take questions before i think we come to essentially the last conclusion slide yes definitely i think this video has everybody saying they want this car yeah. Okay. Hey, let me repeat. Neurons are like Indian roads, and traffic jams are a fact of life. You need to be zen about it. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. So there have been lots of questions about um, the transport itself. Um, I think one question was, how do they make these decisions of reversing direction? Mm. So human drivers. see that they are in a crowded decision and take a decision right so if you want to say that it's triggered by what they see or happening to them 
What we saw, at least for synaptic vesicles, that is the vesicles which are filled with neurotransmitter, the ones which I was showing you, that reversal is not triggered. It's something that it does naturally at a certain low rate. But if it didn't do that, so that in scientific terms would be called stochastic. So if it didn't do that, then if reversal, so supposing you put a challenging situation that you give it some kind of disease state, like a neurodegenerative disease, like I told you this, you know, Alzheimer's or dementia, you give some kind of disease state like that and the neuron becomes chock full of more jams. They are not able to reverse as much and the amount of cargo flow reduces. So it's interesting. There are some cargo which are triggered like human drivers by what happens in front of them. But the one we look at seems to do reversals as a general feature. And that reversing feature seems to be very important for bypassing or escaping traffic jams. Okay, another very interesting question is if many neurons try to change lanes, then won't it just cause traffic jams? In other not lanes? many neurons, many cargo try to change lanes. Will it not cause another lane? Yeah, every lane has traffic in it. So that's why it's just why I said local decision. So you will change and then you will say something else is in front of you, you will change again. If there are 10 lanes or 10 roads which are available for you all right next to each other, why not use them all? Yes. Okay. Another really nice question is just like we see sometimes car crashes or accidents on roads. Are there similar car crashes in our neurons? Absolutely. Remember, I showed you that first thing where first movie where we sh I showed you a traffic jam where you had in green something was there, some fragments of you know what I call like the flower sellers, etc. And a car came and just stopped there. It couldn't do anything. It stopped there. This would be an equivalent of a crash. But you could have much more interesting things happen in neurons. Two cars or two cargos could come and possibly even attach to each other and make a bigger car. Those things are not beyond the realm of, you know, they're not imagination. They could happen, right? So many more interesting things will happen inside neurons than will happen by our human driven cars. But as a first approximation, that's a good analogy to go with. Okay. Um, another interesting question about the hopping. Is if they can hop, why don't they just hop all the time when there's a ah? So that's a great question. Whoever asked it, that's a great question. Okay, so hopping that I showed you was DNA on DNA, which is present in a in a, in a nucleus, which has a lot of space. It's crowded, but it's not like the axon. Which you remember the first picture I showed you? I don't know if I should escape and show. Yeah, we can do this. See this here, how thin these are. So these are extremely narrow roads. Think about narrow roads in like you will see in villages, you know, extremely thin. So there are real constraints on how much space they have. So hopping is not possible because they're chock full of cytoskeleton. They're chock full of things. So hopping, I think, is not going to be a strategy which works inside neurons. But what I wanted, the reason I wanted to show that is because I basically wanted to tell you that traffic jams occur in different parts of cells and with different organisms. And there are many strategies to relax it, some which neurons do. And there is one which I think neurons are unlikely to do. So this is when you peel off the skin of the neuron, you see how crowded it is. There isn't enough space to hop for them. All right. Okay. I think we can go ahead with the end of the slides and then we'll come oh, back. Oh, yes, to definitely. Questions. This is the last slide. So what did we learn today? So this is a schematic of what we found, what uh, a lot of it was done by Paru Su, the former student of mine, where if you don't have anything holding you behind, then you're green, you're growing, there's no crowding. When you have other things which are parked in front of you, then, you know, you have a little bit of difficulty going. It's orange for you. But if you have the flower seller and the fruit seller and something which is front of you talking to other things, that's a hard no. You just cannot go through. So what I would like to you to think about, neurons sense, integrate and transmit. 
Those are the, that's one of the major functions of the nervous system. Traffic jams are a feature of movement in healthy neurons. They are not a bug. And there is one unbreakable rule. If you cannot move ahead, there's no space in front of you, you cannot move ahead and you will come to a stall, just as you would in, in Indian roads. There are many strategies to bypass traffic jams. One is to change your lane or go onto a different cellular road. The second is to do reverse and try the same space again, slightly different arrangement of cargo will be there. You might be able to squeeze through. And third, may not maybe used in neurons, but maybe used in other contexts, and certainly humans want to use it, is the hopping strategy. Are there universal rules? They appear to be at least in limited context in that reversals like we saw with ants is exactly like reversals that we see inside neurons. So with this, I come to an end. I should thank, there are many people who work in this field whose slides I have sort of um, thanked as I put in and put their references in. But the key people who did the work from my lab were Kausalya, who is a former postdoc, Parul, She's now Dr. Barul Sur, but when she was in my lab, she was a PhD student. And Keithana, a master's student who's now doing a PhD in Europe. And my collaborator, physicist Gautam Menon. And this is our lab logo because we are Wormlock Holmes, much like Sherlock Holmes, investigating movement inside neurons. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandra. This was amazing. And we absolutely love your logo. Everybody is talking about how amazing the logo is. Uh, thank you so much for the session today. It was absolutely amazing. And like everybody in the chat window is saying, they learned so much today. Thank you very and much. It was really, really fun. And I think we have time for maybe just one more question. Yes. Maybe before we finish off. Um, I Okay. So maybe we can talk a little about the organism that you study and why you chose this organism to study neurons. Okay. So there are many organisms which you can use to study neurons, starting from humans, rats, mouse, what have you. One of the reasons I chose C. elegans to do these studies is actually it's transparent, right? So that means when I paint the cargo different colors by adding little tagged fluorescent proteins, I don't have to kill the animal or cut it open. And I showed you a movie of that. I just hold it in place and they can see what they want to see. So that makes it very, very, very easy for me to look at movement inside living animals without doing any manipulation. So that attracted me. And I think our lab helped set up some of those methods. The second thing which is very useful is that it's, so it's not enough just to watch. It's very important to watch. And, you know, I think we would call ourselves a neuronal naturalist by watchers. But sometimes you have to manipulate. So if you see, for instance, a string of ants, you might want to break that string and see, you know, walking one behind the other. You might want to wipe that out and see whether, whether how quickly they reform again. So you need ways to manipulate it. And C. elegans has many, many tricks, genetic tricks that you can use to manipulate what is happening inside animals. So that provides you an added advantage. And that's one of my favorite approaches to use. So that's why I choose it. And it's been kind of fun. They're also cheap and easy. <laughs> you work yes. on mice and all the bloody expensive, let me tell you. Definitely, yes. And just last week, we talked about exactly this, about replacing animals in research with much cheaper and easier to use options. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today.